In this video, we're going to take a look at some basics of inverse trigonometric functions. <clears throat> now, I'm going to assume we already know about trig functions, sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, and cotangent, as well as some basics about inverse functions. And um, what we're trying to do here is just learn about a new family of functions that we've never seen before, inverse trig functions. All right, so let's remind ourselves before we get into inverse trig functions, what is it, you know, what does it require to for a function to have an inverse period just in, in a general sense? Well, you might remember that a function has to be what's called one to one. Uh, it's also called monotonic. Um, your instructor might use either of these words. And basically what this means is that your function uh, passes the vertical line test. Uh, that's what's required to be a function, not invertible function, but just a function period, uh, as well as the horizontal line test. That's what's required to be an invertible function. Not going to go into a whole lot of detail about that. Um, you can watch our video on inverse functions if you want to um, re refresh your memory on some of that stuff. But basically, you have to pass the vertical line test and the horizontal line test for a function even to have an inverse. And basically what happens when, when you have an inverse relationship is the point AB becomes the point BA. Uh, a simple example would be like the square function versus the square root function. 3 squared is 9, so the point 3, 9 is on x squared's graph. But uh, on the square root graph, you'll have the point 9, comma 3 because the square root of 9 comes back to 3. So AB becomes BA. On the inverse graph. Now uh, graphically how do you get the um, the inverse graph of a, a given curve? Well what you do is you reflect it across the line y equals x because that's in effect graphically doing what we just did algebraically up here. Um, when you reflect something across the line y equals x uh, basically all that happens is you're switching a comma b for b comma a. So it just hops across the the aisle so to speak and, uh, and if you do that on a point by point basis, you get the entire graph of, um, of the inverse relationship. So just as a, a simple example that just pops into my mind, compare an exponential graph with a logarithmic graph. And you see you have that reflection uh, property there that's, that's true there. So anyways, that's, um, that's just some basics about inverse functions, period, but not really anything specific to trig functions. Now, there's six trig functions and so it would take an awfully long time to go through all six very in depth so what we're going to do is this we're going to pick one trig function uh, namely the sine function and we're going to talk about him pretty thoroughly and then uh, i'll leave it to you to kind of unpack the rest for the other five now i'm not going to leave you totally on your own we're going to make up another video where we very quickly go through all six uh, giving some some of the pertinent details like domain and range and what the graph looks like, but um, but not quite as in depth as where it comes from as as what we're doing in this video. So, anyways, let's let's talk very thoroughly about sine, and uh, and then that's that's primarily what we'll look at in this video. Okay, so we have our our sine graph here, and uh, one thing right off the bat concerns me a, a lot about this graph. This isn't one to one. It's not monotonic. It passes the vertical line test, but it does not pass the horizontal line test. And that's very, very strange. You, you say, well, well, Devin, how are we expected to find the inverse of a function that doesn't have an inverse? You know, it's, it's a great question. Well, here, here's what we do. Uh, what, what we're going to do is we're going to restrict. We're going to restrict the domain of this function to a smaller interval to where it is one-to-one -one on that restricted interval. So look, look here, can you narrow down this <clears throat> curve here and look at a smaller portion where it would pass the horizontal and vertical line test? Well, hopefully you said something like this, starting at negative pi over two and going up to pi over two. Uh, that's just a portion of the graph, but the good news is, is that we still get all the y values from minus 1 to 1. We still get them all, but just on a, a restricted domain. So we can get rid of everything else, and we're just looking on, on this restricted 
uh, domain right here. Okay, so that's, that's going to be important. All right, so um, once we do that, how do you actually get the inverse relationship? Well, think think back. What, what did we say earlier? We were going to, um, well, well, first of all, let's write this y equals sine of x so we can see x's and y's. We're going to take the point a, b, or x, y, and convert it to y, x. So everywhere that there's a y, we'll put uh, an x, and everywhere that there's an x, we will put a y something like this so this is the inverse relationship but there's another step you'll remember um, back from your algebra days once you've swapped the x and the y you try to retrieve the y again we try to get this guy back now uh, you know in the older examples uh, we might have subtracted a term or divided a term or took a square root if there was a square you, you want to do the opposite of what's done to y but how do you get rid of sin? How do you get rid of the sine part of this? You can't divide it because it's not multiplied as sine of y. Um, you can't, obviously can't subtract it. Uh, we can't take a square root. We can't square it. That what What is there to do? Well, here's where this inverse relationship comes in. We're actually going to leave it this way, and, um, <clears throat> and we're going to write it in, in a slightly different fashion. We're going to write this as, y equals sine inverse of x. These two guys are equivalent statements here. So basically if you applied, here let me change colors here, if you applied <coughs> the sine inverse, <coughs> excuse me, relationship to both sides, the sine inverse and the sine would cancel, kind of like a square and a square root, and you would have sine inverse of x, uh, equal to just y, right? So this is your inverse function for sine x. And what it's going to do is it's going to take every x, y point on the graph of sine and uh, switch them. x, y will become y, x. All right, so let's look at that a little closer. Uh, what, what will uh, sine inverse of x uh, technically look like here? If you look back at some of the points on the graph of sine x, all we're going to do is we're going to switch them and put them on the graph of sine inverse. Uh, matter of fact, I could probably even go back to this graph. Uh, you remember how we can reflect this along the line uh, y equals x? Let me choose a different color here, and uh, I'll, I'll do that very quickly. Let's see if we took a red here. Uh, if you looked at y equals x here, the, the graph of the inverse relationship will look something like this. Right, so we're just taking every point here and reflecting it uh, across the line y equals x. Okay, so it would look uh, something kind of like this. Uh, we would have negative 1 comma negative pi over 2 because it used to be negative pi over 2 comma negative 1. 0, 0 when you switch those places would still be 0, 0 and pi over two comma one on the sine graph would become one comma pi over two on the inverse sine graph. So draw that graph, it looks something like this, and this is the graph of the inverse function of sine. Now uh, it's important to note that this is not gonna keep repeating over and over again, because remember we restricted the domain uh, to make sure that the graph had an inverse, and so this guy is not periodic. Uh, let's jot down the domain and range real quick. The domain will be from minus 1 to 1, which ironically was the range of the sine function. And the range of the inverse function would be minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, which used to be the domain, the restricted domain, of the sine function. So, I mean, I guess it's not really ironically, but I mean, it, it makes really good sense when you think about it. All right, uh, one last thing I'll mention about sine inverse. Uh, understandably, a student could look at this and, and get very confused with this notation with the minus one, because that's precisely where we usually put exponents, sine squared, sine cubed, sine to the fifth. So somebody might misinterpret this as one over sine x perhaps, but in fact, that's not what this is. This is not the, um, the cosecant function. That, that's not what this is 
representing here. So to eliminate that confusion, a lot of students and instructors and textbooks, instead of writing it this way, will, will actually write sine inverse another way. They will write arc sine of x. So if you ever see this notation as opposed to this notation, just know that these are identically the same thing. It's simply a change in notation. That's all it is. Uh, nothing more um, and all this does is it eliminates the confusion of, with having the minus one in uh, in what looks like an exponent all right um, so that that's a, a probably a lot a lot more detail than than you wanted to know uh, about sine inverse um, we still have some other things to talk about but um, we're gonna wrap up this video uh, the first thing is um, we need to do something similar for the other five trig functions. Now, I'm not going to go into as thorough an explanation. Um, all I'm going to do is just write them, show the graph, show what the domain and the range is, maybe make a few comments. But, um, you know, we have five of them, so that will kind of speed things along a little bit. Uh, you could probably do all of that yourself even before you watch those videos, just using a similar approach to what we did in this video. Uh, another thing is uh, you'll often be asked to do something with these inverse trig functions, like even something as simple as uh, evaluate them. And there's um, some problems that are uh, easier where they'll ask you to evaluate it at a simple place, but some can get very, very difficult. So we'll need to do a number of examples there. Uh, something like, I'm just making this up on the fly here, sine inverse of negative root three over two. Well, we're you know pretty new at this whole inverse trig thing, so we, we're going to need to talk about how you would evaluate something like that, and uh, and get what that result would be. And uh, and lastly, the the big point of all of this, and we've kind of kind of glazed over that, is um, we're doing this in a calculus class, but we haven't done any calculus. Uh, all this has been done just to set up the idea of an inverse trig function. But at some point, we're going to have to learn how to take all these guys' derivatives and that sort of thing. But uh, that would definitely be something for uh, one of our uh, upcoming videos. So um, you can go ahead and, and fast forward to one of these um, additional videos now. Um, so hopefully inverse trig functions uh, at least is uh, starting to, to make a little sense for you. And, uh, and hopefully all your other questions will be cleared up. Uh, once you watch all these other videos.